for half a century, WJPZ Syracuse has been the greatest media classroom on the planet. We've trained students from the 1970s to the 2020s on how to run a professional radio station. But the lessons learned and relationships formed go far beyond studios and transmitters. Taking a look back through the eyes of those who experienced it. This is WJPZ at 50. Welcome to WJPZ at 50. I am John Jagay. Today I'm joined by yet another member of the iconic class of 1995, Mr. Adam Eisenberg. Welcome to the show. Hey, Jack. Thank you so much. It's it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm part of this wonderful project you've put together. Thank you. And I'm really excited to talk to you today because we're going to dive into the record label side of things. We've talked a lot to other guests about the radio side of things. We're here, your side of the business. But we'll start at the beginning as we do with most guests. How did you end up at Syracuse and then at the radio station? So my father, he relocated during the mid 80s up into central New York. Uh, He was in mortgage banking and he wound up, you know, leading an office based out of Syracuse and oddly enough, fell in love with the area and just was very happy there. And I would visit him, you know, I lived with my mother, single parent in Long Island. And, you know, I would take trips over summer and, you know, holiday break. And, you know, my dad loved the area and he loved the university. And it was always a big plan of his for me to be there and wind up there. And, you know, he would take me to games and it was like prime sports time for Syracuse. Oh, yeah. Derek Coleman, Sherman Douglas era. And even a football team was great. You know, uh, Don McPherson, Rob Moore, they just had great teams. And it was just, it was an intoxicating environment, but he knew I loved music and he would always show me, he listened to WJPZ was it because he's from New York. He was from the land of Hot 103 at the time and Kiss and BLS and Mm -hmm. the market was bleak when you're coming from that area. And, you know, he (laughs) couldn't get into 93Q or whatever. So, you know, he wanted to hear, you know, whether it was Dick Janet's or George Michael's or whatever it was at the time. And, you know, he was listening to JPZ and he would show me that there's kids that do this and this would be perfect for you. And he was trying to nudge me to to make my way there. So, you know, it happened very, very naturally. I kind of knew I was going to come to Syracuse for a very long time. And it was my only choice. Really smart on your dad's part, too. You got to give him credit there for getting you up up into town. Yeah, he missed me greatly and wanted wanted to be around. So he pushed that angle. So so you got to the campus, you went to JPZ immediately then in that case? It was not. And I've listened to most of these. And my story is very similar to something I've heard you say. Um, I was lost for a little bit. Um, I was very socially awkward. Uh, I was very nerdy. I went to all my classes. I was a good student, but I struggled socially. I missed New York. I was very homesick mm-hmm. and I was very depressed. And I didn't know if I was going to make it at the school. Same. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I wandered in my junior year. Regret now, gratefully, that I did not go my first two years, but I went in and I've heard you use the phrase, I found my tribe. And it happened to me as well. I went there instantly at the recruitment session. It was led by, you know, Neon Dion, Dion Summers. And it was just obvious he was a superstar. And I oh, couldn't yeah. believe that there were all these kids that were my age doing this kind of stuff that I grew up listening to in New York. I fell in love immediately and dove right in. And I get emotional when I talk about it. And Deanna and I have talked about it many times, but it changed my life in so many ways. It, it altered my course at Syracuse. Um, it wound up helping me find my career. And just uh, develop socially and in who the person I am. It changed me in so many ways, but much like I've heard you say, I actually, you know, I found my people walking in those doors and it's it's one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life. It's funny you say find my tribe uh, because the aforementioned Dion Summers in his episode, that's the phrase he used time and time again, right. finding your tribe, find my tribe. And I, I feel like that was such a thing for you. And so, you know, obviously you've got all those great members of the class of 95 and the classes immediately around you, but you were saying offline before we started recording, you forged relationships with folks from all different classes and years of the radio station. Yeah, it's happened on both sides. So, you know, when I first started the station, you know, Rocco was making some big moves at Hot 97 in New York City, which was the yeah. state I idolized. And he was, uh, you know, uh, only a few years removed at this time from him being a student and was very active as an alumni. I would come to banquet frequently. And I just latched onto him like a puppy. I just, <laughs> I needed to get into Hot 97. And he took care of me in every way possible. Every summer break or holiday break, he would let me come visit him and just come to the office and just stare at everything. Uh, he set up me for a couple of internships there. He was like, just broke down the first door for me. And then on the other side of it, uh, you know, I mentioned to you before we started recording, I'm, I'm good friends with a lot of people in your group uh, after, you know, graduation, you know, whether it's Beth and Jana and, and Maddie D. So uh, yeah, on both sides of my, my tenure, I've, I've developed some very special friendships. 
Okay, well, so you mentioned Jaina, and she is uh, somebody you worked with post-graduation. Let's start with your story. So you graduate in 95, and where do you go from there? Yeah, so Rocco had sent me up with some internships at Hot 97, and uh, most of the interns are people who sit in vans <laughs> and, uh, you know, go around. And, you know, Hot 97, New York City, they, they had, it wasn't just one van. They had like a fleet. Yeah. It was strong with the street van stuff. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to work in programming. I was a music nerd, a programming nerd. And I wanted to work with the programming team and he would tell me that, you know, most of the interns don't really do that. You know, they do the band stuff, but he spoke to the program director, um, which was Steve Smith at the time, but I really worked under Tracy Clardy, who would later become program director. And he hooked me up with her and she has a reputation for being very tough, but uh, she took to me very quickly. And I think she just picked up that I kind of knew what I was doing or, or had this radio music nerd gene to me. Let me stop you right there for a second, Adam, because I almost forgot to ask you what you did at the radio station. It sounds like that played into the story here. We were just there all the time. Yeah. So, you know, me and Dion and uh, just Kafeli Kalfani, Big Daddy Marv, Alex Corrales, all of us, we were there all the time. We were just stealing everyone's shift, just wanted <laughs> to be on at all hours, staying summer, staying over breaks. So most of my stuff was just being on air, which is ironic because I was absolutely awful. I am one of the all-time worst. Oh, see, everybody says that, but I don't believe no, that. No, no. My tapes are embarrassing. Embarrassing. But everyone was great, and I loved it to death. So I was on air a lot. I mostly did programming stuff, working under Dion. And then Melody Cushion was program director. I was the assistant program director under her. And I just fed into that and just all of us just rotating selector. I was such a nerd. I was so excited to go in there and just, we would do selector every day and and just program the station, you know, to the best that we could. And I just loved doing all of that stuff. But the greatest part about that was we were serviced pretty heavily by the radio reps at the time. And a lot of the major label reps, they would not send their college reps to Syracuse. We were serviced by the same people who were working New York and Philly and Boston. Oh, wow. And so we had some pretty heavy hitters. It wouldn't come a lot, but they would call, you know, weekly. And when we would produce ads, it would show up on, you know, SoundScan at the time. You know, we were making some, you know, pretty moves in, in the market. And they were respectful of that. And it was amazing because a lot of these reps who would talk to us on the station all the time, uh, once I got to Hot 97, it was the same reps. <sighs> so they were so happy to see me because I hadn't met a lot of them. We were mostly on the phone. And they would all tell Tracy, they were like, oh, that's Adam. You know, he's at Syracuse. He's great. They have this great station. You know, it sounds like yours. So like all the reps were so great to me and, and would just kind of like inflate my ego and, and really talk me up. Uh, <laughs> and I I'm still know most of them to this day. It's pretty amazing. So back to your time there at Hot working for Tracy, that obviously was a feather in your cap that her reps are saying they know you and they're vouching for you. And where do things go for you from there? Yeah, she, I mean, she would look at me like, how do you know these guys? And I'm just like, they service my station. And, you know, I became friends with them. You know, the plan was to stay at Hot 97 and talk Moe into getting on air with my awful voice and and working in programming. And, you know, you learn the harsh realities of the struggle on radio and the pay scale at the intro level. Mm. And I tapped out after a couple of years of struggling and wound up moving to Washington, D.C. And I stayed in Baltimore and Dan and I continued being roommates. We were roommates in Syracuse, we were roommates in Baltimore, Maryland. And um, I was in publishing. I got a quote unquote real job, did it for about two or three years, started making some decent money, getting caught up on my bills, was miserable as hell, just miserable. Yeah. And moved to Los Angeles and just said, I'm going to work these radio people and, and these record people and try to get a job. And uh, one of them hired me at Hours to Records in Los Angeles. It was my first job working in radio promotion. So I was now working with all the people that worked with radio stations and you know, it's just basically a salesman job trying to, you know, get your records on the air. And I started doing that and it started, you know, a 20 year run. What year was that you started at Arista in LA? It was 2001. I started working at Arista. I was an LA Reed guy. He ran the company. So it was just prime Arista. It was outcast. It was Usher was breaking. Pink was breaking. Yeah. Uh, and then just the legacy artists that I worked with at WJBZ, you know, I was working a Whitney Houston album, a TLC, Tony Braxton, like these artists I was playing five years prior. I'm now like going to radio shows with, and it was just, it was just an amazing experience. Any uh, stories working with those iconic artists that stick out to you that, that are appropriate to tell for the podcast? So one is Tony Braxton, because we played a ton of Tony Braxton at Z89 and I was just an ARPA and she had a reputation because she was just, this was peak Tony and she was a mega star mm. and she was tough and she was not friendly. And, you know, everyone was kind of afraid of her and 
it broke my heart. I was like, I wanted to hang with Tony Braxton and <laughs> that was not happening. And then, you know, I cut, not to jump ahead too far, but, you know, about 15 years later, I'm at Def Jam Records uh, and Tony Braxton's career over the course of the time had some ups and downs. And, you know, she had been dropped by a couple labels. She landed back at Island Def Jam with myself, you know, both with Ellie Reed, because we're both Ellie Reed guys. And, you know, she was humbled and was the greatest person in the world. Wow. And it was so great to me. And I have all these pictures of like her kissing me in the cheek. And it's just, it's just wonderful. So there's a lot of stories like that, just the journeys you go on together, you know, and a lot of these artists like you see over 15, 20 years, and it's pretty cool. So you're on the other side of it. You're at Arista in LA, 2001, starting out, obviously the world changes in 2001. How does your career go from there? You bounce around a little bit. What's next for you? Yeah, so I was fortunate enough at Arista working with Ellie Reed and his team for a couple of years. And you tend to travel together. So um, there was some consolidation. Our label closed down in 2003. Uh, LA wound up landing at Universal at Island Def Jam and just hired a bunch of us. So I started working at Island Def Jam in like 05, 06. And I was there for a few years. And that was uh, Jay-Z... Uh, P. Kanye, uh, Rihanna. Um, oh, yeah. And I got to launch a band, Fall Out Boy. Oh. And worked with them from the time they were just like six dudes in a van doing about 300 shows a year and then just blowing up onto TRL. And I got to work with them so closely that they hired me to be part of their management team in like 06. And that sent me on about a five year run of working on, on the artist side, working directly in artist management. Uh, so I worked at Crush Management, which uh, manages Fall Out Boy still to this day. I worked with them for a few years and um, just started getting offers and just it branching out and expanding, getting into touring. I worked with uh, Sierra for a couple of years. I was with Estelle and it kind of graduated up a ladder where I round up a bad boy uh, working for Puffy for uh, a little over a year. And I mean, that was just like world tour level where you're just, you're trapped oh, yeah. the entire world. And it became a lot. And I was ready to go back to radio. And uh, one of my mentors at Universal, you know, gave me a chance to come back. In 2011, I went back to the label side at Universal. I uh, was at Republic Records where, um, again, they were just on fire, still are. It was Taylor Swift, uh, The Weeknd, Post Malone, oh, uh, just the biggest stars in the world. And I was there to about 2019. And since then, I've moved over to Warner Music Group, and I am now working with Atlantic Records and Electra Records. Who are the artists you're working with now? Yeah, so right now where it's a lot of Wizzo, it's Jack Harlow, uh, 21 Pilots. You know, I'm fortunate. I get to work with like some of the biggest and greatest artists in the world. Well, and that's a reflection on you, Adam. Obviously, you've made a name for yourself and it's a small industry. So if you weren't good at what you did, you wouldn't be landing with these A-list artists. That's a credit to you. So Adam, a little birdie told me that you have a story about Rihanna, or Rihanna if you prefer. You know, she performed the Super Bowl halftime show this year and bus, plane, what's the deal here? Yeah, it's, it's kind of the highlight of my artist relation experience. When I moved over to Def Jam from Arista, I segged from a radio promotion position to uh, artist development, which is really kind of just getting in the weeds with artists. And I was just incredibly fortunate because I was hired... And uh, I was kind of the end of the totem pole at Def Jam at the time and was given an office all the way down a hallway. And at the end of the office was just a corner, which was empty and filled with boxes and that kind of thing. But a month earlier, they had announced that Jay-Z was going to be named president of Def Jam. And a lot of us thought it was just kind of superficial and it was just like a title. But turns out, you know, he came to work every day. So by sheer luck, my office was where Def Jam section ended and then where him and his Rock Nation team kind of moved in. And I went from having an office that was very desolate to being very popular and highly trapped because everyone wanted to come and, you know, just be around him and hear his voice and stuff. So I was fortunate to get to know a lot of people on his team, uh, guys that are still there, part of the Rock Nation team. And they were playing this record over and over again. Uh, you know, it was 16-year-old Rihanna. It was a Ponda replay. Yep. It was obvious smash. Um it was right in a time of like Sean Paul and Lumidi had very similar sounding records. And so I got to be around her a lot. I was part of her first ever showcase, which was in July of that year. And not to say that I knew her well, but I was around her enough that I was a friendly face, which goes a long way. Mm -hmm. You know, after I had left Def Jam and I was gone for a few years doing my touring thing, you know, I came back in 2011. At this point, you know, she's six records in. She's a massive superstar. And she was doing her seventh record and she was churning out records at a very quick pace. Yeah. 
and we came up with a promotion, you know, with her and her team. Uh, it was called uh, 777 to celebrate seven albums in seven years. Uh, we had this crazy idea to do seven shows in seven countries over seven days, uh, which is a pretty ridiculous pace. And, you know, from her idea that we fleshed out with the team, you know, we packed the plane. We um, reserved a 777 jet from Delta's fleet. We turned it private uh, and packed it with about 300 people. There was about 100 people of like Def Jam and, and her staff. And uh, we had about 100 press and radio people. And then there was 100 contest winners. Uh, so we're on this plane. Is 300 people. Um, a lot of people are not used to flying private. And so when you fly private, you know, you don't have FAA regulations. You know, so now when you fly and you're so used to the routine of, you know, strapping in and being yelled at, you can't do this. And when you're private, the plane just takes off, you know, and everyone's in the aisle. It was crazy. Uh, on the opening day, she gets on the um, intercom. We're working down the aisle. She's like pouring like Ace of Spades champagne to everybody. Uh, <laughs> it was ridiculous. But as the week went along, it got very taxing for everybody because it's you fly, you land, you go to the show. And, you know, we were on a plane of a lot of people who are not used to that pace. And mm. it turned quickly into, uh, it, was, it was very <laughs> chaotic. Um, there are a lot of articles that ran in a lot of trades of just like Rihanna playing in anarchy. And I was fortunate because I had a lot of good videos. It was my, my one time of going viral for a little while. Um, just because I had like really cool stage access. So I had just like really cool videos and just backstage stuff. But it got to the point where she was so exhausted, she kind of disappeared uh, and had to stay to herself. And everyone was just like, you know, you had writers and press who, you know, needed to do interviews and and she had checked out and she was exhausted. We were all exhausted. It was the most chaotic experience of my life. But it does tie back into WJPZ a little bit because a lot of those skills and just managing expectations and, and dealing with artists and, and deliverables, you know, all this stuff is the best stuff that I dreamed about, you know, coming into Syracuse. And, you know, none of this would have never happened without the connections I met, you know, at ZD9 and just Rocco placing me in High 97 and introducing me to this artist culture. Like just, you know, everything ties back to those moments. It is funny how it does all tie back. And it's funny, I was thinking of you, you know, watching Rihanna doing the halftime show. Any thoughts on that, knowing her as, as you do? It's just awesome. Every time she does anything, I had a ton of messages. And I mean, I loved every minute of it. You know, she just went through the catalog. She just has so many hits. I thought it was great. But yeah, I get a lot of messages every time she does something. I'm, I'm long removed from Rihanna experience at this point. But I do have great contact with her and our team. And I try to attach myself to anything she does whenever possible. Crazy to think how long she's been so successful. I remember playing Replay in, was it 05, I think, that it came out? 16 years old, man. It was 18 years ago. What is the biggest difference, aside from the crazy travel schedule, and working with the label side and the artist side? Yeah, so the artist label dynamic is very similar to almost the label radio dynamic. So, you know, when I was uh, working with radio and trying to make money in programming, you're dealing with all these labels that are coming in and they're selling their four or five priorities and, you know, trying to get airplay. Uh, and then when you go back to the label side, you become one of those people who are, you know, trying to pitch, to, whether it's to radio or to television bookers and stuff like that. So the label artist side is very similar dynamic. So I went from the label, you know, just trying to deal with artists and managers and saying, hey, you know, we can do Fallon or we could do Kimmo, you know, what makes the most sense. And so now working on a management side, you become the guy that's taking those calls from the label. Uh, you know, and you working with the artists and trying to just map out a schedule and just trying to figure out what, you know, is the best strategy and what's going to drive revenue and things like that. So it's a very similar dynamic, kind of two sides of the coin type of thing. That is really fascinating to me. And I've got to imagine that throughout your career, there have been lessons you learn at JPZ that have served you well from working in radio, working for the artists, working for the labels and, and back and forth and between all these different entities. It's got to be stuff you learn foundationally at Z89 that helps you. Yeah, absolutely. And and the thing that strikes me the most is just, you know, the competitive nature. You know, my era was, I'm, I'm sure every era is, but we were so competitive. <laughs> we had this kind of sweet spot. Uh, our little pocket was, you know, right after the quote unquote flamethrower years where, you know, how rude and that whole group just killed and just set us up for in a, such a wonderful spot. And then it was, you know, kind of right before, you know, the transition to the Pauls. So we had this really sweet spot where, we didn't have a lot of the issues and we had all the benefits of the class before us. So uh, it was just such a fully staffed, competitive environment. 
And I mean, all those questions translate, especially in the music business. It was very similar. You go to a label and, you know, the label is like, you know, 50, 60 people deep. You know, everyone's brilliant. Everyone's a music nerd, just like you. Everyone grew up listening and, and reading credits and knows their shit. So you, you learn how to play nice with others very quickly. And a lot of things I learned at Z89, especially after the fact, and you, when you, you know, you think about it and you start going to banquets and you start talking with everybody, you learn those lessons of just how to thrive in a competitive environment, how to compromise and play nice with others is very important. And I dove right into that on the music side. And a lot of those, uh, you know, mistakes you learn help you in the future and prime you for success. Any other funny stories that come to mind from your time at Z89? You look back on left because, gosh, you had an unbelievable cast of characters that so many of us know because you've all been so active as alumni. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, my crew, like, we were together all the time and the station was just present everywhere. We were always at the station. We were always at each other's shifts. You know, we had everyone's shift memorized. Uh, you know, like <laughs> when Dion was on, it was literally like a crowd. There'd be five or six of us, like, in the studio just hanging out to 11, 12 o'clock. And then just like once his ship's over, just move to the back room and just always in the station is my greatest memory is just always being around, always listening. We would always have it on. Uh, Dean and I lived on South Campus. It was kind of like a hangout for a lot of people. The station would always in our apartment, always listening to the station. And we would just be constantly like trying to egg Dion on. Like we all had selected memorized. So we knew if someone played something like out of rotation, <laughs> we would just constantly beg him to call and just like yell at someone. And he never wanted to do it. And we would just like constantly be egging him on the call. And then he would do it. And then we just give him a hard time about what an asshole thing that was to do. Like, what is <laughs> so, like just little things like that all the time. But like in terms I had a car, so I was the kind of, and I don't drink, so I did a lot of driving. Okay. And uh, as bad as I am on air, I'm probably a worse driver. <laughs> there were multiple accidents um, where I was in a car with multiple staffers. But there was one incident, we uh, drove up to Utica because B.B. Good, who had graduated just a few years earlier, she was doing uh, nights at a station in Utica, which we thought was the coolest fucking thing that she was on the air and getting paid for this kind of stuff. So. Oh, Yeah. We just decided, I don't know why, just to get in my car and just drive up and visit her and hang out. But we got lost and we were wandering through some side roads and I had to make like a three point turn. Uh, but the roads in upstate New York have these like snow ditches on the side where they could kind of dump the snow. Yes. And my car kind of wandered into it to where <laughs> it tilted on its side. And, you know, we had Marvin Nugent in the car. His nickname was Big Daddy. And it kind of tilted onto his side, which became kind of a joke afterwards. So, uh, you know, my car was stuck <laughs> stuck in a stitch and I don't remember exactly who was in the car, but I believe it was me and Dion and it might have been Kefele and Marv. You know, I'm the only white person. And so we had to go knock on someone's door and get a tow truck, but there's no cell phones. There's no, just a car in a ditch. So they're all like, I am not knocking on any of these doors. So... <laughs> I had to go knock on someone's door and get a, a tow truck to, to come bail us out. So it's just little things like that would happen constantly, constantly to us. So you mentioned having these great friendships at Z89. There was no issue with white guys and black guys being friends. And you said you're the only white, white, white guy in a car full of four people. In Dion's episode, I'm curious to ask you now, both as a white guy and as Dion's roommate, in Dion's episode, he was pretty open about the fact that there were some moments, he was the program director as a black guy, adding quote unquote black music, that he got a lot of pushback and he wasn't quite sure sometimes where that pushback was coming from, if that was academic when it came to music or if there was something a little bit more nefarious there. I'm curious, since you were there with him at the time, I'm curious how you remember that time from your perspective. Yeah, man, it was um, it was very hard for him. Very hard for him. You know, obviously he loved the station. He loved programming. He's a brilliant programming mind, but he was a black man programming, you know, a largely white staff. And part of it also was just the business, Top 40 Radio, in the mid 90s, kind of right before the big TRL, you know, boom of 97, 98, the mid 90s, you know, radio was very uh, splintered. Mm. You know, you had the remnants of, you know, the grunge sound in the early 90s, alternative sound blossoming. And then you had, you know, the hip hop R&B sound. And it was kind of like radio was kind of forcing to go one way or the other. There weren't a lot of middle of the road pop hits. And just based on, you know, Dion's knowledge of the marketing, you know, 93Q, 194, you know, playing more of the rock stuff. And it was a huge void for a lot of the, you know, urban acts 
that had major superstars, whether it was Whitney, Janet, uh, Boyz II Men, TLC. These artists were not getting played in the market. Hmm. And Dion really felt, you know, as a programmer, that it was the best thing to do. It was the best way to train the staff, you know, the media classroom aspect of it. And it just happened he was a black person just advocating for black music. And it was very hard and it was a lot of feedback. And, you know, racism is a very strong word, um, but it's not always the ugliness of racism. There's, you know, there's systemic racism and it struck him very hard. And, you know, there were times when he almost wanted to not deal with it anymore. You know, we almost lost a great programmer because of that. And just you look at all the people that he's touched and how close we came for him walking away from the station. It's very heartbreaking, but he really thought he was right. He stuck to his guns. He had a support team there. And I think in retrospect, he turned out to be right just in terms of his programming success for 20 years after this, just an incredible programmer. But just you look at how music has evolved and a lot of the hindsight he saw in terms of where music was going, you know, also kind of came true. Um, But it was hard. And, you know, as a white person, just trying to be an ally in those situations, um, you know, I came from a diverse background. And just always knew that I had an affiliation for black culture. And, you know, I was fortunate always to be accepted by my peers. Uh, but I always considered it a privilege uh, to have the opportunity to thrive, you know, in a space that's not mine. And I don't have ownership. Okay. But I was very fortunate to have able to make a career in that music. But more importantly, just like lifelong friends. And, you know, you mentioned diversity. And it's just, I know it's a huge issue for Dion and um, it's something he's still working on to this day with the station. And, you know, we go back to Bagwitz and a lot of times we'd be so excited whenever we see someone, whether it be like Mina or Rashad Thomas, uh, people of color who are thriving. But he knew what they were probably dealing with, the same thing he dealt with in a largely a white space. And he would always go out of his way to try to make them feel at home, make them feel like they had family and just encourage them to not walk away in the same way he didn't walk away. And it's hard and there's not a lot I could do in my space, but you don't need to be a person of color to understand that and identify that what's going on. So um, it's something that I know the station and the alumni are trying to work towards and improving. And, you know, I'm very much trying to be a part of that. And, um, you know, I'm hoping it's something that we can, you know, make some progress with. Well said. You kind of mentioned the difference, Adam, between overt racism, and I guess maybe the phrase is implicit bias. What was Dion dealing with? What kind of pushback was he getting when he was adding these records? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is just, I think what hurt him most was the distrust as a programmer and people thinking that he might've been just wanting to play his favorites because he was black and he was playing black artists. And I think that's what hurt him was that uh, there was a lack of trust in his programming sense and that you're just playing the records you like, you're playing the stuff that you like, as opposed to, no, this is best for this market. This is the best for the station to thrive. This is the best way to teach how to be competitive and put students in a position to succeed. And I think that's what hurt him more. And looking back 30 years at the charts from the mid 90s, the proof is in the pudding that he was making the right decision for the radio station. When you see which one of those those songs had the chart power and the staying power. I'm glad to hear this, you know, from your perspective as well. And again, we're recording this prior to the banquet, but at the banquet, by the time you hear this, there is a diversity initiative that the alumni are putting together to make us more of an inclusive group, to make it that way. So I'm, I'm glad that we're getting this issue out in the open and I got to imagine we talked about lessons for the station, Adam. You worked with a lot of hip hop, R&B type artists from, you said, Tony Braxton, Diddy, like having that experience. And as you said, being a fan of black culture, I'm sure it served you well working with black artists. Yeah, it's a fine line. You know, you want to avoid appropriation. Yeah. And I feel like I've always done a good job of that, whether it's going out in my youth to black clubs or working with black artists. And it's kind of like you adopt a culture. But it's a very fine line of appropriation, just in terms of how you dress and how you talk and the language you use and the slang you use. And I've never had an issue. I've always had, whether it's my friends of color, artists of color, I think they catch on that, you know, that this guy gets it and he's respectful of the culture and he's participating, but in the right way. It's a very fine line, um, but it's very important to learn where that line is. Adam, I really appreciate your insight on what can be a pretty heavy topic, but I obviously don't want to leave it there. So let's transition out of that. And I want to close with one more funny story. Uh, I know you worked with my classmate, Jana Fiorello, from the class of 2002 when you were at Hot 97 and when you were in New York. I know there's a story there that you're dying to tell. Yeah. And I love that girl to death. 
we met at a banquet. I feel like this might have been a banquet where the two of you were like just cracking jokes the whole time, like in the limo. And like it was easy to see that the sarcastic sense of humor between the two of you shared that you two were quickly becoming friends. Yeah, that has not changed. We are very much alike and we still play that role. We hate on everything in good nature. Of course. I like to think we're both good people, but we hit it off like really quickly. And I integrated pretty seamlessly into your group. Yeah. And I love them to death. But uh, we got to cross when I was working with Nicki Minaj as part of her management team. And I was on the road with her a lot. And she was at Hot 97 a lot. And at that time, Jana was with Hot 97. I'm going to stop you for one second because this only came up on the podcast yesterday. Jana, not Jana. I do it all the time. Sorry. But yeah, so Jana was at Hot 97 and she was a big fan of Nikki. And at the time, Nikki was running the gimmick where uh, she would meet her fans, uh, the diehards called the Barbs, and she would sign their breasts um, <laughs> in Sharpie. And she wanted her breast signed. So <laughs> we were at an event. I think it was a Hot 97 concert that Nikki was on. And I brought her backstage and introduced her to Nikki. And Nikki uh, signed her breast pretty low in front of me, and it was it was quite a moment. But it got picked up by a magazine. I don't know which one it was, but it, it was <laughs> one of those supermarket trade magazines. I actually ran a photo of her breasts with Nikki signing it. And I think every time it comes up in my feed on Facebook, we, we each repost it and share that moment of me looking at her breast. <laughs> in a sisterly fashion, because I love her to death. Thank you for the disclaimer. Adam Eisenberg, class of 1995, thank you so much for spending a few minutes with us today. Really appreciate having you on. Thank you. I love all these podcasts and you were doing a, just a terrific job with this and it's quite a wonderful legacy for you to um, leave the station. I appreciate that. Thank you. The WJPZ at 50 podcast is created entirely by the staff and alumni of the world's greatest media classroom. It's hosted by John Jag Gay, class of 2002. Editing help from James Bames Grundy III, class of 2020. Imaging by Maureen Cooper, class of 1999. And Ed Lacombe, class of 1985. Podcast artwork by Marty Dundix, class of 2001. Follow WJPZ at 50 on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now.